Uh, so, when we roleplay, we pretend to be people who we are not. Um, and those people who we pretend to be might belong to cultures other than our own. They might, for example, be French revolutionaries. Uh, they might be Danes. They might be orcs. Um, when we design rocks, uh, the depicting these cultures and helping players depict the cultures of the characters becomes a major concern. So how do we do that? That's what I'm going to talk about for the next 15 minutes or so. Uh, and without any final answers. <laughs> Just to be clear on that. Uh, my qualifications for talking about culture, I do not have a degree in anthropology. Um, I'm from Norway. This is actually Fatland Farm. That's where the name comes from. I've lived in Papua New Guinea as a kid. Uh, I've lived in Istanbul as a dot-com web designer. Uh, I have lived in Holland, Denmark as a student. I have lived in Beijing in the People's Republic of China. And I have taken my master's degree in Helsinki. The people who tell you that the Nordic cultures are homogeneous are full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> I also, for some reason, appear in this picture, which is a family photo from Ruyang in Benjo in the People's Republic of China. Which, of course, back in Denmark, I met another international student. We married. And we have very similar temperaments, so our idea of a honeymoon was that she would spend the next 16 months in Uganda in East Africa, and I would visit as often as I could. Mm -hmm. So, for me, uh, cultural differences is not a theoretical matter. If I get them wrong, I might inadvertently insult people who are really important to me, or misunderstand in serious ways. Uh, we're often asked if we experience cultural crush in our marriage, and of course we do. Every marriage is a cultural crush. Uh, but the question I'm not asked very often is uh, not about culture crush, but about cultural benefit. The benefit of having access to different cultures, of having not one, but two, or maybe even more solutions to the great questions of life, uh, such as how to manage family finances, how to, how to deal with child rearing, how to relate to the deaf family member, or can larks tell stories? Uh, and this is also why I find cultural simulation in Lost to be very relevant, because it can hint at further answers, or be a very low-cost travel. Uh, definition time. Culture. Shared mental assumptions that guides interpretation and action by defin defining appropriate behavior for various situations. Um, there are many definitions of culture, and different meanings of the word, and so on. But this is my favorite for rock purposes because it translates to this how we do things around here. <laughs> Our internal maps that we share with others, and the others might be in the role playing subculture, it might be in the family, it might be in the nation state, but the shared sense we have with others of how we respond to different situations, how we interpret them, our mental maps of how to deal with life. So, what iceberg model? A lot of the stuff that we often talked about as, uh, as culture, the flags, the food, uh, the traditional dances, and so on, is basically the top of the iceberg. It's the stuff that's easy to spot on the surface. And below it is this huge complex of world with different senses of time, different senses of I. What is an I? What is a me? Um, different ideas of conflict resolution. What is a valid conflict? How we resolve conflicts? What is my role in society as a member of this family, that family, in relation uh, to these social situations. Uh, and the whole cultural iceberg is relevant for Rump, because below the surface is where all the really interesting and important things happen. And then, but then, unfortunately, we come to the hard limit of Rump design. Because in theory, if we had infinite resources, we could have a Rump that lost a year, had 100,000 players, who were all, in real life, orbiting the Earth in a space station. I mean, what's holding us back from doing that is resources. Right? But this is the limit we're not going to bypass. How much information you can cram into a player's brain. Or if you're a player, how much information you can absorb and actually meaningfully act upon in the LARP. If we here were to play a LARP based on the French Revolution, we might, and do it plausibly, we might, for example, need to speak the French language, circa 1783. Uh, and that might take a few years of hard studies to master. <laughs> Uh, so, for this reason, a lot of culture simulation can never be perfect. You've never walked in the shoes of another, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have anything to teach you. So, how we approach this as designers, I'm introducing now the idea of the nudge 
which I previously called keystone element, and which I've seen similar usages in the term core mechanics of games and so on. The nudge is a small piece of information, a rule or a piece of knowledge that you carry with you into the game. That's a tiny little piece of information, relatively speaking, compared to learning the French language. Uh, but when you distribute this information to players and you begin acting on it, it causes secondary effects, which cause tertiary effects, which cause even more effects. And so these small nudges can affect a lot in big ways. And the dream situation, of course, uh, is to establish the whole iceberg of culture through a handful of simple nudges. If this wasn't clear, don't worry, the rest of my talk is examples. <laughs> So there's something called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, uh, which states that um, we are only able to think the thoughts that language allows us to think. Uh, those were my words, not the official words, but anyway, it's a hotly debated question in science. But as a law designer, I don't need to worry too much about science. Uh, I can put it to the test in logs. And even if it doesn't prove anything, we can still prove, prove a useful log design tool. And I stumbled on this almost accidentally in uh, 1997, the first big LARP I worked on. Uh, 110 players, five days, we actually had to shut down Mental Asylum as our play area. Um, but in game, this was the future, we were on the ground, and we were living in a version of George Orwell's 1984. 1984 has this sophisticated language, Newspeak. Uh, the point of the language is it's unsophisticated. Double plus good is a perfectly valid word. We simplified that. Only one word the players would need to know, and that was freedom. Well, that's already a word in the Norwegian and English languages, but in this context, the word freedom meant death. The government had ordered it so. So if you went around talking about freedom as in freedom, uh, then you would be arrested and interrogated as a thought criminal and punished. Uh, and what the picture you see here are players who are shouting, freedom to the traitors, freedom to the traitors. <laughs> and that's ironic when we look at it from a, from a distance, but after three days, uh, seeing the people screaming on the top of their throats, freedom to the traitors, in front of some people that had actually been arrested as traitors, was actually quite scary. I was very close to saying kut at the whole LARP. Because this one linguistic change caused change the perceptions the players had of everything in the game. It made the society much more harsh. And it also made a sport out of always finding an appropriate application for the word freedom in the sense of death. He's a free man. <laughs> so, some years later, I was on the design team of Panopticorp, a lot about the world's most evil advertising agency. Uh, I've been told that uh, that's actually quite a tough competition. <laughs> but Panopticorp was fictional, and it was super evil. And we wanted to help our players to play these super evil advertising professionals without giving them written characters or anything like that in advance, and we had barely invented so we looked back at the experiment with freedom equaling death, and we created um, the dictionary of corpse speak. This was the only handout players received, and it was about this big. And the dictionary of corpse speak, you could carry with it with you, it was an in-game document given to all new employees, defining the office jargon of Panopticon. In this office jargon, here are some examples. Uh, next sec, more or less means the same as cool, that's next sec, next second, that's cool. But you don't say cool, because if you say cool, uh, then that's last sec, that's Monday. And you don't want to be Monday because months are ordinary, boring people living ordinary, boring lives. And you're free to think of them as people again, as individuals, once you quit Panoptical. Uh, they are concepts like prom time, the joyful time of work, downtime, uh, time spent doing nothing productive uh, except partying, out carding, ultimate penalty, you receive a blank business card, which means you're fired. And so it worked. I mean, the, the players slash characters, uh, there was no <coughs> alibi here, uh, lived in fear of being outcarded. Um, they spoke these words, internalized this language, uh, and the language kind of helped them understand how the company worked. Uh, and quite a few players have commented later that when they got jobs, when they grew up, got jobs in the media industry, advertising, and so on, corpse speak came back to them. <laughs> as the best possible words to describe the dynamics they were observing in the office. And some of them uh, ended up quitting those jobs for that exact reason. <laughs> so it almost worked too well. We did not intend to damage players' careers. <laughs> <laughs> so these were a couple of languages of, of uh, examples of linguistic nudges. 
Uh, but then what about the body? Because obviously culture is represented in more ways than just the words we use and the thoughts we think. And I'll show you some examples of labs that have used um, embodiment also as a way to define culture. Again, cubigenesis, uh, stumbling upon this by coincidence because we thought uh, totalitarian fictions were cool and could make for great drama. So we adopted this gesture as a way of saluting people. Um, so the rule was that you would need to do this whenever you met someone in the corridors who was of higher rank than yourself. <coughs> and if someone of higher rank than yourself passed by you and you didn't do that, then you could be in trouble. So players became incredibly aware of where they were in the societal pecking order. Uh, and the societal pecking order became present in the law in a very strong and visible way. <coughs> and again, this has some lasting effects. I was the head GM, but it, when I was in the game, I was there as a proletarian, the lowest case. So um, I would get into the habit of recognizing my superiors and saluting them. And one morning, I, I'm sleeping uh, in a sleeping bag on the floor of this asylum. Uh, and I no wake up by noticing someone is in the room. And I look up and I recognize that that guy is an administrator, he's of the highest class. So I immediately like, jump up from the sleeping bag and salute him. <laughs> and then I remember that the law ended yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> More sophisticated use of body language. Uh, at this law, the White War, a Danish law held in 2012, uh, it was conceived of by a Danish Iraq War veteran. Uh, who in this law, it's fantasy, it's, it's a fictional setting, but it also kind of showcased, it was intended to explore how the occupation of Iraq worked or didn't, depending on your perspective. So the gentlemen and the ladies in the blue caps here, they are from a fictional society who represent Western martial culture and who have practiced moving in military ways, a certain kind of tough, indivi rugged individualism, uh, who are intentionally aware of potential threats in the neighborhood. Um, and the people in white here are from the local, uh, the occupied peoples. And they're very loosely inspired by Middle Eastern cultures, but also with other cultural traits. Um, and while some of the things they practiced before the law was to be in a highly family oriented collectivist culture, uh, who move along uh, very closely, often have several people together. Uh, have a louder volume in their culture than the soldiers have in theirs. And so you can imagine what happens when a group of people loudly, many of them together, approach like an individual rugged Western martial uh, person uh, and then act on the final piece of body language, which it's very good to hold some, grab someone's hand and hold it as you're talking to them. So this was basically a recipe for culture crush. Blut piece, uh, Swedish LARP. Uh, held it initially two years ago, but uh, there are multiple reruns. Uh, the men here, if you can see it on the image, are holding sticks. This is a fictional patriarchy, a patriarchal honor culture. Uh, and the men in this fictional society, the Mu people, are given a stick on their initiation as men. And they're told that this stick is, with this stick, it's your duty uh, to make sure that the crazy creative energy that is inside with them doesn't get out of hand. <laughs> so, um, the law had a very, very, very sophisticated culture design. They had initiation rituals as part of law. Uh, they had uh, marriage negotiations. Uh, they had that one evening of the year when the ordinary rules of proprietary were suspended. Uh, but I think that ultimately what the only thing that would have needed to establish this unpleasant patriarchal upon the culture was that one thing, the nudge, the stick, Can you and its function. what it was that you said about hmm? the stick? Can we yeah, just we go back to the yeah. start of group yeah. yeah, the stick. Men were given the stick on their initiation as men. Uh, and they were told that your duty now as a man is to take the stick and you need to use it um, to prevent that wild creative power which is inside women from getting out of hand. So it was his duty to strike his wife or daughters. Not a very pleasant society, but one from which you can take parallels and from this heavy duty fictional patriarchy and look at the real world afterwards and suddenly notice things or ideas that were similar. Now, I also come on my next point because we have a very extensive vocabulary now, law, all kinds of law, 
to talk about oppression, to talk about aggression, to talk about conflict, subjugation, manipulation, uh, and so on. And what I wish for is that we get an equally rich vocabulary, and we don't have it at the moment, I feel, an equally rich vocabulary to talk about meaning, joy, connection, love, relationships, transitions, life. And I mean, I'm, I'm guilty in a lot of this like dark oppressive games. I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to be more positive these days. Um, and so, uh, three years ago, I joined a group uh, of love organizers in Norway. Uh, and we uh, decided to try to make uh, a lab where these positive aspects of the human, uh, of the human condition and human experience would be center stage. And in addition, we tried to make a full cultural iceberg. We wanted to make a culture that was not our culture, but also this. Instead, we wanted to make a culture that was a completely different culture. That ideally, no moment of the game should be like uh, Norwegianness. Or as it were, Swedishness or Danishness, because we had an international group of players, even though we played in Norwegian language. And that lot was Koi Koi, uh, which was held then two years ago in the forest of Norway. 75 players, five days, uh, in the classical Nordic mold, where, where you just don't stop role playing, um, continuous role playing. And the Koi, Koi Koi is a lot about the fictional hunter gatherer people, the Ankoi people. They're fictional, they're people we invented, um, they're not representations of any new world culture, but at the same time they're anthropologically informed. For every feature of this culture that we put into the game, we have to be able to show that this is a pattern that occurs in real human societies, not necessarily in the same time and same place. So, some of the tools we used to establish this culture, the Angkoi people, uh, were when working with the body, we had ritual workshops, and we run among those workshops later today at 10 p.m. Um, we gave the players very sparse instructions uh, for which ceremonies and rituals were important to the characters and then used the workshop to train them into making this into full-fledged ceremonies or rituals. Uh, but we also worked a great deal with text and with storytelling. Uh, this image here is from a storytelling session. We wrote some 30 myths from scratch. Um, that explain different aspects of the Ankhoi people and distributed them players and ordered the players to please tell the story in character. And we wrote a rather long text um, which tried to explain the Ankhoi culture from the point of view of an Ankhoi. And this was our main handout to players. And if I still have a bit of time, as it seems, uh, I'll read you a quick translation of some of the content there. It opens with this. Why do you hurry so? You are not hunted. You are not hunted. Here. Now. Me. I sit here by the creek, listening. Shall I tell the story of what I hear? I hear water. Running. And with these opening words, we try to get the players into a different mode of time, a different perspective of time, and into a different perspective on the relationship with their surroundings. Another section explained the religion of cosmology. Uh, it has a title Quaff, which does not have any meaning in Norwegian. Uh, and it opens like this. One asked Altnuk, how many Quaff are there? Altnuk laughed. You can't count Quaff. There are Quaff in the sky, and Quaff on the ground, and Quaff beneath the ground. People Quaff, and Owl Quaff, and Unquaff, and Rain Quaff, and so on. And then it goes on listening up all the things that have quaff. So in this sense, we introduce an animist belief, uh, and we introduce a sense of divinity, which is very different from what we're used to in monotheistic or polytheistic societies. But without using those words, we try to articulate everything in unquote terms. And then we have a section explaining pride and conflict resolution, which we call face. A little moment there. One said I could not tell tales. In this way, I lost face. I told a tale about the one who took my face. All who listened laughed. So I won my face back. And the one who took mine lost theirs. He hit me, and I hit back. 
We fought until all in fun came between us and said we must return each other's faces and not fight. We both said no, but they kept standing between us. One day later, we were bored. I gave his face to him and he gave my face to me. It is good to have face. Yeah, this is an in-game conflict which is over face which is being resolved uh, through friendly fighting. <laughs> now, all of this material, uh, the kind of design key we used to figure out what we need to introduce in the game, was that there are social roles. We defined what it meant to be a child, what it meant to be a young man, a young woman, a young nook. We had three genders. Uh, we defined what it meant to lead a ritual. Uh, we defined uh, things like the idea of the mask, which we said the mask wears you, not you wear the mask. Uh, and all this came together at LARP. Now, did this work? Mostly, yes. Uh, one of the things we had problems with was gender, because we used very subtle nudges. Uh, we wrote gender into the texts, but we used the workshops for practicing body language and ritual and ceremonial, ceremonial improvisation. So, for example, we had this idea as a design team that the Ankoi do not objectify women. Like, uh, in the texts, women are never described as beautiful or attractive. In, in those words, they describe as, as strong, uh, as proud. Um, but men can be described as, like, uh, with words meaning, like, beautiful or attractive, and so on. But it took, like, five minutes until after the rob started, and we heard somebody talking about the beautiful women and strong men of the Ankoi. <laughs> And similarly, we struggled very much with establishing the third gender using words alone. Now, gender can be hacked in LARPs. It's been done before many times in the Nordic countries. But apparently, with gender, words are not enough. Some of the things that did work was the social roles, the cosmology, the way the society functioned. Uh, players got it almost immediately and started playing it on it almost immediately. And many people com commented on the sense of time that they left the LARP with. And on the LARP that was definitely by design, low conflict, little action, but lots of interpersonal interaction and lots of, um, of transitions. One wrote that the, the, uh, the calm I found the Koi Koi will be with me for a very long time. And um, one second. <laughs> uh, so, to summarize, cultural design and norms is still very much a field of exploration. Uh, but I think it's worth exploring. And the reason I think it's worth exploring is that, from one perspective, every major problem we have in the world today is ultimately a problem of culture. Global warming, gender inequality, class inequality, and so on. If we can change culture, we can also change institutions to begin solving these problems. But changing culture is hard. Cultures change all the time, but not necessarily by intention. LARP will not save the world. I don't believe in that. Love will not change the world in a significant way. But, uh, LARPs are excellent test tubes of culture. Authors can imagine cultures, uh, theater, uh, theater directors can put them on stage. We can imagine them and then model them, prototype them, figure out how they work in practice. And so if we, in the test tubes of LARP, can figure out culture change that is meaningful and that can spread, we might be one step closer to solving world problems. Thank you.